I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the points on each slide, but you guys can have my slides and kind of review a little bit more of what what will be on the test. Um, so we're, we're just focusing on cornea and external disease today. So on um, anatomy, they're probably still going to ask you about the sort of three component tear film. They've, they've kind of changed their thinking on this in in the recent BCSC, they just kind of say it's a, it's just sort of a, a glob of all these things together. Um, but historically, they've thought of the tear film as kind of three distinct layers. So you've got your um, lipid, aqueous, and mucin. And they like to ask where each of them come from as well. So that's a common question that'll come up. Um, the other question that I see commonly in, in tests is how much how much tear production is happening, so two microliters per minute. And it seems like everything is two, and so it's kind of tricky to remember like the aqueous formation, the aqueous outflow, and the tear film production. So you have to kind of get those things straight in your mind. Um, some of these numbers they do like to test, so they'll ask you if a patient's cornea qualifies them for megalocornea or microcornea, and so you have to kind of understand what um, the corneal diameter is at birth. It's about 10. And as an adult, you get up to about 12. Um, it is a little bit wider in the horizontal versus the vertical. You'll figure that out when you're doing PKs. You have to be a little bit more cautious about how you center a PK in the vertical meridian. Um, the power of the cornea, they love to ask. So the anterior surface is about 49. On the positive, the posterior surface is about minus 6. So you get the combination of about a plus 43 diopters for the total power of the cornea. Um, you'll kind of just this will kind of just make sense as you're more experienced in ophthalmology when you're looking at calcs for IOLs. The average corneal power is about 43, 44 diopters. And so just remembering that the posterior cornea has negative power. The overall refractive index is another thing they bring up, 1.33. Um, they like to ask this really lame question that keratometry usually measures 2.3 millimeters apart. So they just like to ask details sometimes. Um, the thickness of the epithelium, again, something that you'll learn as you're doing refractive surgery, learning about that, it's about 50 to 60 microns. It's hydrophobic, so the lipid um, sort of cell membranes are they're rejecting fluid as they're trying to get into the cornea. And so you've got the hydrophobic epithelium that kind of inhibits some of the transmission of medications across the epithelial barrier. Um, they do sometimes bring up these three layers, but I don't think it's all that important. The desmosomes sort of link the middle layers, and then you've got the hemidesmosomes that anchor the stroma to the bottom. This comes up a lot. Uh, Mammalus kind of pounds this into your brains that Bowman's layer is not a basement membrane. There is an actual basement membrane of the epithelium that will be type 4 collagen and stain with uh, PAS. So Bowman's layer is not a basement membrane. I think it's on like every test I've ever taken. Bowman's membrane is about 10 microns thick. It's type 1 collagen. Um, this is the other key to Bowman's is that it usually scars if it's violated. So if you get a, an injury that's just epithelial, that's why you don't get a scar in the cornea. It has to go through Bowman's. Um, you go a little bit deeper into the stroma. The stroma is about 480 microns thick. It's mostly water. If you get higher water content than about 78-80%, then it starts to get opaque um, and thicken. Type 1 collagen is mostly what's there. You've got type 3 involved in wound repair. Um, they like to ask those types of questions as well. The keratocytes are what kind of turn into the scar-forming cells in the cornea and lay down the type 3 collagen. Um, on pathology slides, they'll sometimes show you a picture of a of a cornea on pathology and it won't have any little clefts in the stroma and that means that it's actually swollen. So it's kind of, when it's when the collagen looks really compact, it looks it's actually a swollen cornea. Um, I think that's it for that slide pretty much. Again, that water content level is about 78%. Um, decimase membrane, pretty thin membrane, 3 to 12 microns in thickness. Um, for some reason, they like to separate the fetal banded versus the adult non-banded part of the of decimase membrane. Um, I don't exactly know why, but if you think about a fetus coming first, it's the anterior part versus the adult part, which is the posterior part. And again, this is a PAS-positive basement membrane, 
so it'll it's type four collagen. The endothelium um, is pretty thin as well, four to six microns thick. It's just a monolayer of cells. Um, at birth, you've got a lot of cells, 35 to 4,000, and then you get about 2,500 cells in an adult. Again, if you think about like ophthalmology, the experience you're getting when you're looking at PKs, you're looking at endothelial cell counts when you're doing transplants, they tend to come in at about 2,500 to 3,000 cells. And so some of your experience can help you so you don't have to memorize these things. But um, Cell counts that sort of, they, they like to bring this up as well. When you're doing cataract surgery on somebody, what is what cell count gives them a risk for corneal edema? And the thought is that it's about 1,000. Um, and again, with donor corneas, we definitely want above 2,000 cells. And so along those lines for like the corneal thickness of the tumor, is it like 640 or 650? Um, I think it's somewhere in the sixes. I, it seems like it's different in a lot of different resources, but. It's like artifact. You start to get corneal edema. Yeah, I mean, I have 680 micron corneas that are perfectly normal that I do LASIK on, and so. It's, it's sort of a, if you have somebody with Fuchs dystrophy, if they're above about 650, then you're at risk. So, okay, the sclera, um, the thinnest point is right behind the muscles. It's also thin right in front of the muscles. It's an, on average about a millimeter thick in the posterior part. Um, it's mostly type one collagen. The reason why it's not clear is because it's irregular collagen um, instead of the cordia, which is a nice regular collagen structure has a little higher water content as well. Um, you'll get these little plaques anterior to the muscle insertions. And um, when they get dehydrated, they'll look very thin. When they hydrate, they're a little bit thicker. But these are normal aging spots that you'll see. Um, again, if the water content drops low, then it'll, it'll become a little bit thinner and more see-through. Um, so just to summarize the collagen type, so type 1, you've got Bowman, stroma, and sclera. And type 4, it's always the basement membrane. So in the cornea, you've got the basement membrane of the epithelium and then Desimase the membrane. And then type 3 does your wound repair. Okay, so inflammation of the conjunctiva. You've got follicles versus uh, papillae. Sorry, these are kind of small, but um, the common ones that they like to ask are about herpes and molluscum for viral causes and then chlamydia of the follicles. So the chronic follicular conjunctivitis, that's your main differential. You can also have, you can have benign folliculosis, but drugs can cause it as well. Um, and then there are some kind of unusual things that will bring it, bring it out also. Um, with papillae, it's a little bit more nonspecific. A lot of times when I look at conj, it's a mixed reaction. I just try to figure out which one's more prominent to help me understand what's going on. Um, so you'll usually see papillae and follicles in it in, when there's inflammation. So um, papillae, the key is that it's a pinpoint blood vessel that's kind of centrally in the elevated lesions, whereas the follicles have sort of a dome shape to them without a vascular structure right in the center. And you usually think about bacterial infections and allergy and floppy eyelid. So with uh, giant papillary conjunctivitis, those are papillae. And so if you flip the upper lid, Got those really big cobblestone papillae that's, that's with uh, some of these allergy things. So chronic follicular conjunctivitis, again, the main things that they're going to test you on are herpes, um, molluscum, so make sure you're, you're looking around the um, eyelid and lashes, and then um, chlamydia as well, and some of these other ones are pretty rare. Uh, flick tenules. Um, Kind of interesting things, these are um, migrating inflammatory nodules on the surface of the eye. You'll see these in the cornea, you'll see them on the conjunctiva. Um, the thought is that these are usually, probably in our country, staph related, so I usually treat these with a combination of antibiotic steroid. If you have somebody who's been in an endemic area for tuberculosis, you should think about that and test them for tuber tuberculosis. Um, there are some other rare things that can come up. So PPD is kind of what you're thinking when you see a flictenule. And again, they're kind of, I don't know, they're, they're not, it's kind of a, a trash bag diagnosis where it's like, well, something's on the conjunct, it looks kind of funny, but usually you've got a bunch of blood vessels coming up to an area of whitening that's kind of ulcerated and will stain. It's usually pretty tender for the patient. So degenerations of the cornea. Yeah, Lee? How is that different from 
Um, so marginal keratitis usually, um, it's, it's kind of in that category if it's at the edge of the cornea, honestly. Um, so it's kind of tricky to differentiate it exactly. No, uh, you'll still see vessels. Marginal keratitis tends to be um, a little bit more flat than this. This is usually a pretty elevated edematous nodule, and it's most commonly on the conge. So marginal keratitis is specific to the cornea, but you can get flectennules that are actually that look like marginal keratitis. So they're kind of a tricky to distinguish sometimes, but most of the time on a test, this will be on the conge. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so degeneration. So if you have a something that is normal and then it's sort of getting it's degenerating over time, you think about pinguecules and pterygium are the most common things. Um, but you can also get the spheroidal degeneration and the, the limbal girdles that you get kind of at the edge of the corneas that are not um, band keratopathy. That's also a degeneration. So you'll usually see those at three and nine. You'll get just a little whitening of the of the cornea. And then conjunctival clasis is something that we see really commonly. So here's your hypersensitivity reactions, another thing that they like to bring up. Um, so type ones, you just think about allergy. It's mast cell driven. Um, type two, you're thinking about, you've got antibodies and antigens plus complements, so kind of the three together. So you have OCP and Morins classically as type twos. And then type threes are antibodies and antigens with no complement activation. And so um, those are kind of the ones that you get in there. And then, so they love this phacoanaphylactic anophthalmitis as a type three. Type four, you've got flectennules. AKC can kind of be in both because it can be a delayed reaction. Graft rejections, classically type four, you can also get that as a more acute type one type reaction too. Um, so granuloma is commonly type 4. Sympathetic ophthalmia, another one they like to ask about type 4. And then they've got this type 5 category where it's like a stimulating antibody in Graves and myasthenia. They kind of fall into there. Okay, so they like to talk about stains and ask you about fluorescein versus rose bengal and what they're actually staining. So fluorescein is essentially staining disruptions of cellular junctions. Um, and then rose bengal and lysamine green are kind of devitalized epithelial cells. So they generally, they don't have to be broken down. So usually they'll stain things that fluorescein won't. So they can kind of bring out more subtle things. I don't even have any. I don't use it. But a lot of people like it. Um, AKC, really common. Um, it can be pretty bad. You can get scarring. Um, there's the... the um, anterior subcapsular cataracts that you can get. Um, so don't confuse that with the, the ulcer that's a sort of a VKC ulcer that's on the cornea. Sometimes people mix that up. So corneal ulcers with VKC, you've got cataracts with uh, AKC. Um, these usually kind of wax and wane, but they're pretty much there all the time. And can be kind of tricky to treat sometimes, but. In kids, you try to treat this with uh, steroid sparing medications like tacrolimus, topically. Um, otherwise, you're kind of treating it with steroids and just dealing with the consequences and the side effects. A cornea that's vascularized and blind doesn't really sort of matter if you have a, you develop a cataract, but you have a, a, a the trade-off, steroids. You get a cataract or you get a corneal blind patient, right? So sometimes you just have to hammer them with steroids and take a cataract out in a teenager. They can be really tricky to treat. Uh, VKC, so these are usually, we don't really see VKC a ton in Utah, um, but the high association is with atopic dermatitis. Um, it usually gets better as they age, um, but they like to ask about these shield ulcers. So these are usually superior in the cornea underneath the lid. Um, and then if you look for cobblestone papillae on the upper eyelid, kind of similar to GPC, but a little different appearance. Um, so I think this is why we don't see it as much, because we don't have as many African Americans in Utah. Oh, they, also, they like to ask about these Horner-Trantis dots that you can get. These are pretty extreme. 
Um, I've seen these a few times in patients where they're just kind of pretty small right at the limbus, like 0.2 millimeters, just tiny little dots that are kind of elevated 360 degrees around the limbus in BKC, but that's a pretty extreme case there of it. Okay, so we talked about most of that. So you've got kind of, the pathology has a bunch of mixed inflammatory cells um, with BKC. And you try to treat these systemically and topically with antihistamines, mast cell stabilized combinations. So. And then um, with BKC and AKC, I try to get them to an allergist um, because I do think that desensitizing them with shots can help. Um, this is something that they do bring up occasionally when you have big papillae where pred acetate has some precipitates in it and so they don't really like you to use that because it can kind of get caught in between the, the ridges and cause more inflammation. So dexamethasone is a little bit better drug for it. Superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, kind of a, a tricky diagnosis to make in a lot of cases, but what you're looking for is just sort of sectoral conjunctivitis of the upper conjunctiva underneath the eyelids. Um, thyroid dysfunction and contact lens use is where you usually see this. And it stains pretty good with rose bengal, as you can see here, but usually you can pick this up just by pulling up their eyelids and having them look down. You can kind of see it there. Um, it's common to have filamentary keratitis associated with this. It's usually redundant conge that's kind of gotten swollen and, and, uh, and enlarged over time. And so the treatment for this is usually just topical anti-inflammatories will get it but not always. And so sometimes I'll put them on cyclosporin, um, just treating essentially dry eye, keep them really lubricated with restasis, sometimes 2% cyclosporin. You can cauterize the bulbar conjunctiva to shorten it superiorly. Um, a lot of people go in and resect it and do amniotic membrane grafting to kind of help. They like this, don't use a silver nitrate stick on the eye. It cauterizes <coughs> sort of out of control. So, um, Is it so it's usually pain, pain and irritation, foreign body sensation, similar to kind of lower eyelid conjunctival cholesis. So recurrent erosions, uh, extremely common. Usually there's a history of a prior abrasion or trauma to the, to the eye, but also in EBMD you see a lot of this. Um, generally they wake up with pain in the middle of the night or in the first thing in the morning. Um, when it's kind of, when it comes on, um, we're essentially treating these with antibiotics, lubrication, contact lens, and then potentially a cyclopenylate or atropine. Um, if it's chronic, you use Miro to kind of help get the epithelium to sort of stick a little bit better. And then there's surgical treatment, stromal puncture. I've done this a few times when it's not central, but you can't do this when it's central. Stromal puncture, you're essentially puncturing through Bowman's layer to try to create scarring and adhesions. And so if it's peripheral, it's okay to do this. Um, but if it's central, you can't really do it. So generally, I do a superficial keratectomy with diamond burr polishing. So you're kind of polishing Bowman's, kind of roughing it up a little bit um, to help the skin um, seed in a little bit better. You can do PTK, which is a laser-based, essentially, treatment to Bowman's layer to help it stick as well. Um, just a couple little things about viral um, that'll come up on tests. So when you have a hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, um, Coxsackie is a common one, and then EKC that'll come up. Um, EKC, they'll sometimes ask you about the types of the virus, and those are the, the main ones that, that cause it. Um, Newcastle's disease, I've never seen it tested, but it's kind of a unilag, kind of this combination of things. They've got lung issues plus those two. Um, usually in people who are dealing with chickens. And molluscum is a very common test question. It's a pox virus. Again, that chronic follicular conjunctivitis. Look for the lesion on the eyelid. Okay, so chlamydia. We, we don't see it as much in uh, the U.S., but this is a common issue worldwide, so it comes up on tests a lot. Um, so you'll get the Herbert's pits, which are kind of these... Um, almost like hollowed out areas on the, at the limbus. Um, the Arlt's line is conjunctival scarring on the, on the upper eyelids. It's a, kind of that white line right there. Um, these you'll see on pathology, so you get the intracytoplasmic inclusions. 
Um, yeah, so those are kind of the different ones that you'll see. Usually A through C on the eyes that are causing most of the issues. Perinaud's disease um, comes up occasionally. Usually lymphadenopathy, granulomatous sort of follicles. Um, so you'll see kind of elevated lesions on the conjunctiva. Huge differential diagnosis. Biggest thing is cat scratch disease. Um, I don't know that I ever really saw this, but this is something that potentially could come up. Sporotrichosis, they like to ask that question on uh, step exams, but it doesn't really come up on the eye much. So those are just kind of all the things that can cause granulomatous disease on the eye. Okay, so reactive arthritis, they love this one. Can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. Um, they like to ask you about what the rash is, the keratoderma blenteragicum on the palms of the hands. Um, HLA B27 associated disease usually. So floppy eyelid syndrome, really common diagnosis that I make in clinic. Um, it's usually not a lot of sort of elevated in inflammation. So you're usually not seeing follicles, it's usually kind of a papillary reaction. Um, the eyelids essentially just divert. If you pull on these lids, you can see their lacrimal gland. I mean, it's crazy when you see how, how much you can divert the lids. Um, lower eyelids become kind of lax and away from the globe as well. Um, high association with sleep apnea, so get them tested for that. Um, generally, the treatment is just lubrication and then potentially taping their eyelids closed, wearing moisture chambers. Um, but sometimes you can get plastics to do a big wedge resection of the upper eyelid to kind of treat and get rid of the floppy eyelid. But you got to do sleep apnea testing on them. Uh, pigmented lesions, again, you've got the 14-year-old kid who comes in with the growing lesion on the conge. It's usually cystic in nature. Um, I still take these off because parents are freaked out and melanoma is becoming a little bit more common of a diagnosis even in young kids. So um, if, it's, if it's bothering parents, I'll take it off. Otherwise, I'll just watch it closely. But the key is, is that there's cysts and there's increased melanin, not increased melanocytes. So that's kind of a, a big differentiation between PAM and just racial melanosis or conjunctival nevi. So proliferation of intraepithelial melanocytes in PAM and usually no cysts. So with PAM, you're kind of thinking a little bit more pathologic. You're headed towards potentially developing melanoma. So we're going to watch these a little bit more closely. And usually um, you're not seeing this in a teenager that's going through puberty. It's usually a 30-year-old, 40-year-old that's having these um, growing over time. So pretty high risk of melanoma. Um, but a lot of times we'll just watch them closely. And if we're seeing changes, then excise them. Okay, so malignant melanoma. Um, I never saw this, but I, I was reading this on a, on a test prep website. To look at atypia on the path slide, you have to bleach the specimen. Um, I haven't heard of mammals doing this. I guess I didn't really see that many melanomas, but a lot of times you get too much pigment in the lesion, and so you can't tell what the cells are doing. And so they'll kind of bleach out the pigment to be able to tell what the cells look like to see how much atypia and things there are. Um, again, this is becoming more common. Um, what you worry about is when you have a lesion that's elevated and you have sentinel vessels going to it. Um, increased risk of meds if it's thick, so two millimeters thick. And then they'll ask about this a lot where it's, it's worse if it's kind of in non-sun bearing areas or sun exposed areas. Um, so the eyelid margins kind of, if, especially if you have a palpebral um, conjunctival pigmented lesion, that's a worrisome thing because the skin is not exposed to the sun very often there, the caruncle um, as well. Usually these will go to regional lymph nodes, but you've also got the other things that it'll head to kind of in far away. Um, not commonly tested, not commonly seen much, but gelatinous plaques. Um, this can be a benign thing. Um, usually we would treat these or take them off because they look too much like cancer. Um, oncocytoma, they just love this one for some reason. If you have a mass at the caruncle, think of oncocytoma. <coughs> Um, there's a lot of mitochondria, so you get eosinophilic cytoplasma in it. It's more common in women. 
Um, corneal nerves, so diseases where you get enlarged corneal nerves. Um, I never came up with a way to, to remember this. I just tried to remember a couple of them. Keratoconus is an easy one to remember where they look a little bit more visible. Um, but actually enlarged, bigger corneal nerves, these are the diseases that that's in. Um, acanth amoeba, the reason you usually see enlarged corneal nerves is because you get inflammation of them. And so that's a common um, thing that we're looking for when we're thinking of acanth amoeba is perineuritis, where the corneal nerves will actually enlarge a little bit. Ichthyosis, autosomal dominant, um, nasty looking skin, you get corneal opacities, you get band keratopathy pretty early on in this. There's lots of syndromes that come up with it, um, but it's, it's, an, it's all about hydrating the skin. The skin just isn't well hydrated because it's thick. All right, burns. So corneal burns will come up a lot. They'll ask you why a base is worse than an acid in, in causing long-term damage. And it's because the alkali denatures the proteins but doesn't precipitate them. When they get precipitated, it almost acts as a barrier to prevent acid from penetrating deeper into the eye. And so historically, alkali burns are worse. Um, they, they usually don't ask about this grading scheme, um, but if you just think about when you've got a total epi defect with stromal haze, and but it's not the whole limbus, you're at type three, and then you've got a larger amount of the limbus is type four. Those are kind of the big dis distinguishing points. So you're gonna irrigate, you're gonna debride. These people should have a couple liters of saline flushed through their eye before a pH is ever even checked. And then you're gonna irrigate until the pH is normal. Um, usually hit these people hard with steroids in the first few weeks and then kind of taper off quickly. Um, you're kind of battling epithelialization versus the inhib inhibition of that with steroids. And so, but you, you have to knock down the inflammation first. Um, usually treat with an antibiotic if there's an epithelial defect in cycloplegia to help. Um, you want to check pressure in these people, especially with alkali injuries, because they can have very high eye pressure. We usually put them all on doxycycline, lots of lubrication. Vitamin C is also helpful to decrease collagen breakdown. OCP, a type 2 hypersensitivity. You've got the immune complexes of IgA. Um, they'll sometimes bring these up, all these drugs that can cause sort of a, a, a chronic inflammatory scarring of the eyelids as well. Um, usually you're going to treat these patients with Dapsone on the test, but you have to watch out for G6PD or sulfa allergies. Um, we're starting to use more big gun medications like Celsept and Rituximab. And a lot of times uh, that can keep the disease pretty quiet. Um, other things to be thinking about with cicatricial conjunctivitis, um, we do this to a lot of patients, so glaucoma medications, um, bad infections that cause membranes and pseudomembranes, so EKC can give this to you. Um, you could also get this with bad burns. Um, autoimmune diseases that can bring it on and then obviously the trauma. So we can do this to patients, conch surgery, get recurrent pterygia that can sometimes scar up to the eyelids, things like that. So radiation is another common one. All right, so interstitial keratitis, um, syphilis is the most common cause of this. Um, when it's congenital syphilis, you get the Hutchinson's triad with teeth problems, the cornea, and then deafness. But also, these are the other things we're thinking of. Did I say syphilis was the most common? Sorry. Herpes is the most common. Syphilis, less common, but happens. If it's bilateral, you're thinking syphilis. Um, lots of sort of uncommon things that can cause it as well. But. Uh, Kogan syndrome comes up occasionally on tests. The biggest key is that they have hearing issues. Uh, Tigesins, not a very very fun disease to take care of. Um, just little inflammatory nodules that come up on the cornea. Um, it's usually bilateral. They're kind of they'll kind of come and go regardless of what you do to them. Um, if you treat them, sometimes they get better. Sometimes they don't. If you don't treat them, sometimes they get better. Sometimes they don't. So they're kind of frustrating. Um, I usually try to get these patients on restasis and treat their exacerbations with steroids. Steroids, what they'll classically test on is that it will kind of delay the, 
um, sort of resolution of these long term and it increases their chance of recurrence. Lee? Is the type of um, I honestly don't know with Tigesons. It's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure what what's in those little inflammatory spots. Um, these will have negative stain to them, so it'll kind of stain around the lesions at the base of them. Um, usually no other inflammation, so their eyes are pretty quiet. They just have pain and photophobia. So do you put them on I do, yeah. I try to get them on it immediately, the first time I diagnose it. And then you'll treat them with low to max or bread to kind of calm it down, help them. Brian tried to put me on restasis in the parking lot, so. I just do it. <laughs> just, you just get restasis. <laughs> Um, spheroidal degeneration, there's lots of different names for this. Um, it's usually bilateral. It's not lipid. These are actually just weird protein deposits that come up. It's not really understood what this is. Um, usually the patients don't notice this, but if it becomes sort of visually significant, you'd go remove these. It looks like elastoid degeneration. Again, not a common thing that's tested, but... Um, other things that are on the cornea that come up, again, that the limbal girdle of, vo of vote. Um, I see this a lot in patients who get this little clear space on the limbus, and then you'll have this little band of whitening um, that's usually not very elevated. It's kind of flat. Um, it's just collagen changes that are happening within the stroma of the cornea. It's pretty anterior. Hassel-Henley bodies, they like to ask about this. You'll see guttata in the peripheral cornea that's non-central. Those are just norm normal aging things. I wish we could just forget about these, the mucopolysaccharides, but they just keep testing us on them, even though I've never seen any of these in my life. Um, the cornea is clear in hunters, and the skies are clear in San Filippo, is the way to kind of try to figure out that these do not have corneal disease with them, um, whereas the rest of them can have corneal clouding. So if you can memorize those two with clear corneas, that's usually all you need to know about those two. Hunters is X-linked. Hunters like to shoot the X. Um, so sphingolipidoses. These are all autosomal recessive, except that one Fabry's that's X-linked recessive. Um, it's on the differential for whorl keratopathy with verticillata. And so um, the other things to think about are amiodarone, chloroquine, and then endomethacin and NSAIDs can do it as well. Pretty common to see this on patients. Um, it's usually asymptomatic, not causing a lot of issues. I, it's hard to know for sure if it's causing dryness because I feel like everybody has dry eye. So I usually just lubricate these patients and don't really recommend that they stop their medications. And is it, it's all on the epithelial Yeah, really superficial. So cystinosis. Pretty rare disease, but we do have a couple families in Utah, so you'll, you'll see these patients occasionally. Um, they usually do not have a change in vision, which is really surprising when these get really bad, but they're pretty photophobic. Um, they're usually short in nature. They have kidney problems, so they usually have had kidney transplants. So um, their eye problems are tricky to treat because the treatment is topical cysteamine every hour. So try to get a kid to take a drop every hour to help him reduce his corneal crystals. Um, it can cause band keratopathy, so you definitely want to treat these patients and encourage them to get their cysts under control. So here's a patient that I saw a couple weeks ago. In 2012, this is what his cornea looked like, and this is what it looked like last week. So these crystals are in every layer of the cornea, and it's, it looks like fiberglass in the corneas, essentially. And his vision was 20-25 with correction. Um, and this doesn't do it justice. They're just everywhere in the cornea. So cysteamine drops every hour, both eyes, mainly to get rid of their photophobia and prevent band keratopathy. If you did a PK on that patient, it'd come back. So again, it's not usually visually significant. Uh, Wilson's disease, we love these consults. Come rule out, get a Kaiser Fleischer ring exam, make sure that they don't have Wilson's disease. Um, but it comes up a lot on tests. Usually that ring will go away if you treat it with penicillamine. Sunflower cataract, um, the Kaiser Fleischer ring is in Bessemer's membrane, so that's kind of the key point for the test. 
So band keratopathy, think about chronic inflammation, multiple eye surgeries as causes of band keratopathy. These are elevated, they usually cause irregular epithelium. Um, a lot of times the reason we're treating these is because the epithelium is breaking down and so they're having pain and irritation. Um, so you do EDTA chelation, you can do this in clinic or you can do it in the OR. I usually take them to the OR and then um, you can potentially do PTK to kind of help with the um, with the corneal opacities and it usually comes back. It's kind of tricky unless you get the inflammation under control. Silicone oil in the eye is another high risk factor for this. Iron lines, another dumb test question that they just love to ask you about. I don't, they're pointless other than a Kaiser Fleischer ring. Um, everything else doesn't really matter. But Stalker's line is at the pterygium, the Ferry's line is by a bleb, and you've got the hudson stolly line that's normal in aging, just at the where the lower lid tears kind of hang out on the inferior half of the cornea. Um, other random deposits, so Krugenberg spindle is probably the most common one that you see. You get melanin on the endothelium, um, but argyrosis can cause kind of a discoloration of the sclera where it looks a little bit blue in color. Almost, uh, it almost does look silver, which is kind of a bluish hue. Okay, so marginal keratolysis, or PUK. Um, so these are some of the common, common test questions that they love to hammer you out on. So it's usually unilateral, and it's right at the limbus, so it's peripheral. It's immune-mediated where the collagen is actually melting, so you're getting actual thinning of the cornea. Um, it's associated with autoimmune diseases, so most commonly rheumatoid arthritis is, is where we see it the most, but you can get it in lots of different autoimmune problems. Um, a lot of times they'll have inflammation of the sclera sort of right next to it, so again, autoimmune process. Um, treatment, we essentially, you've got to immunosuppress these patients. Um, there's a, there is some argument that topical steroids actually play a role. Um, in helping to control the local inflammation, but this is mostly systemic in nature that you're trying to treat. Um, as soon as the epithelium heals, you're kind of out of the woods, but these can spontaneously perforate, so kind of hard to, hard to treat in some cases. Uh, Morin's ulcer, usually painful, progressive ulceration. Um, it usually does not have the scleral involvement. The test question is hepatitis C association. Um, there's kind of a, a leading edge to it that's kind of undermined and you've got kind of this overhanging cornea so it's almost like it's getting eroded underneath like water does to the side of a mountain. Um, again immunosuppression, you can resect the conge back, recess it to kind of get the inflammatory factors away. That doesn't help with PUK. Not, not, as, not as good with PUK but it is a treatment that is used. Um, Terrians is usually younger patients. The epithelium is intact, so it's usually not staining. Um, but you've got this kind of lipid leading edge at, at the edge of blood vessels that are coming into the cornea. Um, they love to ask about the against the rule astigmatism is what you're getting initially um, in the intact epithelium. Um, these are tricky because they can perforate with mild trauma and there's not great treatment for it. You're just kind of lubricating these patients and hoping they don't thin too much and it burns out. Um, bugs that can in, go in through an intact cornea. I've never been able to memorize this either, so I just try to remember a few of them and move on with my life. Uh, gonorrhea is the one that I worry about the most, but um, you can get crinobacterium as well. These other ones aren't as commonly tested. Crystalline keratopathy can be anything. So on a test question, it's most commonly strep, but you can have any disease cause a, or any infection cause crystalline keratopathy. You can even see it in steroid use. Um, so herpes simplex. So these are intranuclear compared to intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies in chlamydia. So that's one of the test questions. Um, usually multinucleated giant cells on GIMSA or, or zinc prep. The HEADS trial. Honestly, I'm. It didn't seem like this came up a lot on OCAPS, um, but these are kind of the points of the HEADS trial. Um, it, this just sort of breaks down all the different sort of groups that were tested. So when you have stromal keratitis, what they essentially did is they said, okay, we're gonna treat all these patients with topical steroids and local um, antivirals. 
and then we're going to see if oral acyclovir matters in the first group. And there was no added benefit to oral acyclovir when you're treating with local trifluridine in stromal keratitis. Um, another group that they did was trifluridine with steroids versus trifluridine with nothing else. And it looked like topical steroids actually did help. So in stromal keratitis, technically all you need is topical steroids with some sort of antiviral, either honestly, either oral or local. But in the studies, it seemed like they were powered to help with the local treatment. And so that's what came out in the studies is that that was beneficial. Was that, was that, was that a sponsor? I don't know, actually. I've wondered about that, but you, you have to assume so. Um, so if, if you have iritis from HSV, then they said, okay, how about in this case, do, does systemic acyclovir help? So you've got the topical steroids and trifluridine in both groups, and then the placebo versus acyclovir. There was a trend toward benefit, but not statistically significant. So we usually treat these with oral acyclovir. And I usually treat stromal keratitis with oral acyclovir too. It's such a benign medication. If it's going to help, HSV is a crappy disease. Um, what about in somebody with epithelial keratitis? Does it prevent other problems? If somebody comes in with dendritic keratitis, if you give them um, acyclovir, does it help? So most of these patients would historically be treated with topical trifluridine, um, and there was no benefit in preventing consequences of disease if you used systemic acyclovir. Again, is this what's done in practice? No, but it's the good old HEDS trial. HSV prophylaxis, the dose is 400 milligrams twice a day versus placebo. It did reduce the risk of recurrence when you're prophylacting somebody. It, was be it worked better in stromal keratitis. Okay, risk factors. Hard to say for sure what the risk factors are, but this is what came out, is that if you, somebody has epithelial keratitis, it doesn't increase their risk of recurrent epithelial disease. But if you have stromal keratitis, it definitely increases your risk of recurrent stromal disease. So you want to be a little bit more sort of long-term aggressive with your suppression when somebody has stromal keratitis versus epithelial keratitis. That make sense? Zoster. So nobody's going to miss this zoster. This is a crappy zoster patient that we had at Moran. It essentially destroyed the upper eyelid. Um, but they love to test about Hutchinson's signs. So if you've got a lesion on the tip of the nose, you're more concerned about ocular involvement. Primary care doctors use this a lot to, get, to determine whether or not to get an eye exam. Um, topical antivirals are not useful in this. You're using a higher dose of acyclovir. And then oral steroids. Um, I think most people use oral steroids when somebody has this bad of disease. Um, so another common test question, dendrite versus pseudodendrite. Um, HSV gives you dendrites. Pseudodendrite comes with uh, BZV. And the staining is what they'll ask you about. The base stains well with fluorescein, but the edges stain well with rose bengal. And this one just doesn't really stain with either one. And you'll usually get scarring at the site of the dendrites, the pseudodendrites in VZV. Uh, fungal infections, not as common here in the United States. Um, some of the stuff that tends to come up is whether or not to use voriconazole. Um, natamycin works really well for filamentous fungus, but doesn't, and voriconazole is not really that much of an added benefit in these situations. So. I've not seen like any fusarium infections out here. They, all, like, come to, all come to Farmington. Ones. I have one. It's loads of fun. Because the only ones that I've seen have been like, grown like aspergillus. Yeah, you get aspergillus in Canada most yeah. commonly, but I have a fusarium ulcer. It took, I'm not kidding you, like four months to heal the epithelium. It was brutal. She had um, HSV and then developed a fungal ulcer like three weeks into it and was referred to me like, I, we don't know what's going on with this patient. So we cultured it and fusarium grew. It was awesome. Um, acanth amoeba, again, not as common in Utah, but we see it occasionally. Um, we're usually using confocal and then um, cultures to try to diagnose this. They like this double-walled cyst. Just think about acanth amoeba being a fortress. It's really hard to treat and kill. Um, here we're using usually chlorhexidine and PHMB, and then we'll sometimes ask the patient to get broline from other states, other countries. You can get it from Canada and France pretty easily on Amazon. Uh, microsporidia, I don't know, never seen it on a test. 
you're thinking about HIV patients that have complications from this. Okay, keratoconus, they will ask lots of questions about keratoconus. Um, they'll show you all these signs that you have to know. And I mean, these are some of the easiest test questions to get when somebody is, is looking down and they say, what's this? What disease do they have? Sometimes that'll be a, a quick question. You get fly through rings, you get high drops, you get the prominence of uh, corneal nerves. This is the vertical striae boats lines in the cornea. Um, scissoring on retinoscopy. Rizzuti sign is when you shine the light sort of temporally and it reflects and causes a shadow on the on the nasal or on the limbus. Um, high drops, they'll ask you to do a PK in high drops. Wait. You can inject air bubbles. Usually we just treat them with steroids and cycloplegia and give them time. Be surprised at what they can see after a high drops episode. Um, so keratoglobus um, usually doesn't have any real corneal findings, so you're not seeing all those same things that you were seeing in, in keratoconus, but they can develop high drops and they can perforate pretty easily, but they're super steep corneas and really thin. Not a lot of great treatments for this. PKs are kind of hard to do in this condition because the corneas are so thin. Um, pellucid is actually fairly rare. Um, usually the pellucid patients that we diagnose are, they probably just have a variant of keratoconus. Um, the key to pellucid is sort of where the thinning is happening. So with keratoconus, the thinning happens at the apex of the cornea and pellucid, the thinning is happening just above the thinnest area is where it kind of sticks out. So this is kind of a diagram of it. So you do classically get that crab claw appearance, but these can actually be keratoconus patients too that have that appearance. So you've got the protrusion just above the thin area. Another just distinction, keratoconus versus pellucid, kind of that sagging cornea. Okay, so corneal dystrophies. Um, I think this gets hammered into you pretty good by mammalists. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can get a Munson sign. It's not as prominent because the, the thinning is so low um, in the cornea that when you look down, it doesn't have that exact same sort of effect on the lid. We have a couple of really good pellucid pictures in Axis. I should have pulled those in of patients that, we've, that we have here. Usually don't get a perfect Munson sign, but it can cause some of that distortion down low. Um, so I'm actually going to just brush through these because I think these are ones that you get pretty good with mammalists. Um, but anterior basement membrane dystrophy is really common. Um, very underdiagnosed. It's usually bilateral. You're going to see little dots or cysts sort of in the epithelium, but usually you'll just see kind of irregular lines. Um, lots of erosions. 10% get erosions, but 50% with erosions have EBMD. It's another one of those common things they like to ask about. Meesman's is autosomal dominant, not very common. Um, you can have some corneal thinning and decreased corneal sensation. These cysts stain with PAS. Um, it's this peculiar substance that no one's been able to come up with a better term for. Um, usually pretty minimal symptoms and usually don't have to treat these patients, but they can get erosions as well. And so you're usually lubricating and, and sometimes treating that, that part of it. Good old gelatinous drop-like dystrophy, autosomal recessive. Um, these are usually causing problems for the patient, but are really tough to treat because PKs don't really work. Reese Buchler is another autosomal dominant one. Um, this is kind of the pathology key that they'll ask about where you don't have Bowman's. And it's just kind of this connective tissue that's not as regular as Bowman's is. You get kind of irregular epithelium that stains with mesonic trichrome as well. Uh, another one they like to ask, recurrence rates in PKs. So you've got lattice, granular, macular, and Reese Buchler's has the highest rate of recurrence in a PK. Uh, another one you don't see very often, curly fibers on EM, occasionally tested. What's that? Yeah, yeah, how are you going to diagnose that? Send their cornea for EM. I haven't done that before. Um, you've got this memorized, so 
that's an important one to keep straight. Macular, granular, lattice. There's not really much to add to Mammalus' lectures. Just kind of go through those. Again, the recurrence risk in a PK. Um, Avellinos, it's kind of a combination of granular and lattice. It's also on the autosomal dominant. They do like to ask about the TGF beta 1 dystrophies. Um, erosions happen, and they'll stain with both granular and lattice, so they'll stain both of those. Um, Snyder's comes up. You got 50% that are kind of these yellow white crystals, sort of right outside at the limbus. They don't extend all the way to the limbus, so there's kind of a clear space there. Um, but these are kind of deep, they're just below Bowman's layer. Um, sometimes they'll ask about this where you, they can see a little bit better at night. Um, there is association with lipid problems, stains with oil red O. So there's kind of things to think about when it's lipid that comes up occasionally. So fleck dystrophy, I've probably missed this, I don't know, never seen it. There's such tiny little changes that it's kind of hard to, hard to diagnose. But um, there's lots of associations with it, and it's kind of glycos glycosaminoglycans and lipid deposits. Um, we do kind of see this a lot. Looks kind of like crocodile chagrin. It's pretty common. Doesn't really cause a lot of issues, but you'll see this in VA patients. Fuchs dystrophy, commonly tested. Make sure you know what Fuchs is. Guttata. They'll show the path slide just like this. You'll be able to diagnose it pretty easy. Um, it's not just reduced endothelial cells, but you have to think about those endothelial cells as they die off. The other ones around them get bigger. And so that's another way to diagnose it is with a lot of sort of polymegathism and then pleomorphism of them. It clusters in family, but not perfectly genetic. But you can diagnose these people pretty young. They usually don't come in complaining, but you can see it in their 40s. Um, the timing of treatment really depends on morning symptoms. A lot of times that's when their cornea is on, taking on the highest stress. So DSEC and DMEC are kind of the treatment now. But you can hold these people off with Muro and just uh, lubrication to try to prevent uh, some of that swelling that's happening. But usually if they're symptomatic, we're headed into surgery. PPMD, actually pretty commonly seen too. I see these in a lot of screening patients for um, refractive surgery. You're essentially just getting thickening of the um, endothelium. And so you'll see just little areas right on the endothelium that are kind of heaped up. Usually doesn't cause a lot of issues, but it can be pretty, pretty impressive and cause problems. I uh, don't know what that is. P <laughs> graft rejection. Um, you got to watch out for these battle lines and kudahus lines. We have a patient at the VA right now that has a pretty good one of these that's kind of marching across, destroying his endothelium. You'll see it regress back as it improves, but usually leaves kind of fibrosis and damage. So a sign of endothelial rejection. Is the line actually just the casing that's like that? Um, I think so. I think it is just KP, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, we were able to reverse it. I mean, it was like at two thirds, and now it's like at one third last time we saw him, but he has a really bad cataract, so who knows how he's doing. <laughs> yeah, he's still hand motion. Um, ocular melanocytosis. Um, the key here is to think about melanoma risk, glaucoma risk. Um, usually just taking photos and watching these people really closely get ultrasounds with Harry to look for nevi in the in the uh, choroid. Uh, ligneous conjunctivitis, really tough. I've never seen one of these, but it sounds like it's really, really hard to treat. It's a type one plasminogen deficiency. Um, this is kind of interesting. So before you take these people to the OR, you have to watch out because they can have respiratory tract involvement and can cause really difficult issues with anesthesia. So that'll come up sometimes on tests. But these are kind of yellow elevated really rough looking uh, lesions of the lids. Kawasaki's disease, um, young kids. Um, the reason that this comes up is because you'll get bilateral conjunctivitis in a majority of them, then you can have uveitis as well. So you'll, you'll uh, see that. They, they love to ask about the systemic treatment, don't treat with steroids. You have to treat with aspirin and IVIG because of that risk of coronary artery aneurysm. So they'll ask, 
what test should you get in this patient you just diagnosed with Kawasaki's disease? And it's, it's an echocardiogram to look for those. Uh, big fronts of the eyes, those are the associations, high myopia. You'll see this in cataract surgery. The front of the eye is just massive in high myopes, but also some other diseases. Um, staphylomas, I don't know that I ever saw this asked, but decimase is absent is kind of the key to this. And you'll get, it's, it's essentially an anterior dysgenesis syndrome where you'll have all kinds of weird connections. Uh, cornea plana is a really flat cornea. As you can see here, it's just ridiculously flat, usually in the 30s. Um, I've had somebody, I've seen somebody with a native cornea that was like 36, but I've never seen anybody um, below that. Um, lots of weird things that can happen to them, but really shallow anterior chambers, as you can imagine, without that vault of the cornea. Uh, Sclerocornea, we have quite a few patients with this that we've been dealing with. Um, you essentially have that type 1 collagen that just keeps going into the cornea irregular, and so it ends up opacified. Um, usually bilateral, usually does not progress, but really hard to treat. These need a PK if, they're, if you're going to get any vision out of them early on. Uh, megalocornea, so big corneas, horizontal diameter greater than 12 at a newborn, 13 in an adult. So common numbers that they'll test you on. Normal axial length compared to boop ophthalmos where the whole eye is large. So that's the differentiating feature. X-linked, usually male, that have it. And some of the associations. Um, yeah. Microcornea, so less than 9 in a newborn, less than 10 in an adult, and they're usually pretty flat corneas. Peter's anomaly, so again an anterior segment dysgenesis syndrome where decimase and endothelium are not appropriately formed and so you get connections with the lens and iris. Lots of glaucoma, uh, usually bilateral. You got PAC6 mutations you have to think about in here. So other PAC6 mutations, axenfeld riger peters anomaly, and then aniridia. And they'll love these questions where aniridia is sporadic versus familial, and which ones have the higher risk of the Wilms tumor. Sporadic. Okay, decimase tears. Um, so vertical, usually forceps trauma, or um, you get boat striae where you'll see little lines in the cornea and keratoconus. Horizontal, think Hobbs, Strie, and congenital glaucoma. Luckily, we don't see as many forceps injuries, but they still happen. I have like a 50-year-old who had bilateral forceps injuries when she was younger. Um, I'm pretty sure, is that Lynn's patient? I think we did a DSEC on her. It's kind of interesting, because her, her cornea was kind of chronically cloudy, and she did better. It's kind of weird. Uh, Ched. So endothelial dystrophy in CHED. So because of that, it's usually um, an edematous cloudy cornea. Whereas congenital stromal dystrophy is just a thickened cornea, but usually not edematous. So that's the key differentiating feature. Um, you've got the autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive that they'll sometimes ask you about, where there's a little bit of a difference to it. So stromal dystrophy, not progressive. Um, but these are no corneal edema because the, the actual endothelium is functioning fine. They say normal pachymetry, but they're usually thick. They're still thick corneas, but they're just not cloudy corneas. Uh, we only have a minute. Congenital cloudy corneas. You guys memorize this. Think about it when they show you a cloudy cornea in a kid. One of the hardest things on OCAPS is like coming up with a differential diagnosis. Um, and so kind of try to step back for just a second and think, okay, what else could this be? Um, because they'll try to trick you on some of these, but so that's a good one to always remember. Um, Riley Day syndrome, I don't know. This is kind of the thing, they don't want you to kill patients, that'll come up occasionally. But they have decreased uh, corneal sensation and they'll end up with neurotrophic keratitis. So, what's that? Yeah. Exactly. Um, aniridia, we talked a little bit about this, um, but again, it's a PAC6 mutation, and you have to watch out for the Wilms tumor in the sporadic kind. 
there's lots of other things that come with it, so they're usually not seeing well along with the stem cell deficiency, which is the thing that we battle the most. Ectopia lentis, those are the things that cause it. We've got Marfans, homocystinuria, wheel marchesiani. In these patients, their lens can, is usually kind of a little bit on the small side. Um, Ehlers-Danlos, connective tissue disease again, that causes lots of loosening of everything. Uh, genetic cataract associations. Um, the, this is a pretty high yield slide with all this, all these things that they love to ask about. Myotonic dystrophy comes up a lot with Christmas trees. Anterior lenticonus with Alport syndrome. Mature cataracts in Hollerman strife. The oil droplet cataract, they love this one with galactosemia that goes away. You don't treat it, you don't take it out. You just treat the galactosemia and it can reverse. And then your ice syndromes are another common test question that they like to ask about. You've got Kogan Reese, Chandler's, and essential iris atrophy with difference in the iris component, whereas you'll still have some of the other malformations in all of them. Cool? Way too much info. Lots of info in cornea problems, but it's easy to take pictures of, so they like to test it.